hard in Louisiana for about 14 years now. And, um, well, she's a saint. I'll say that. Come on. Don't I be hard. I've been called a lot of things. Well, I've heard her be called an alien, saint. too. I've heard her be called an alien because she just works forever and she wakes up happy every day and she's just magical. And they want to know whatever I'm on, they want some. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about, girl. That's all I have to say for now. Sorry. Well, I love David, and thank you. I'm certainly no saint, but um, I've been lucky and I'm fortunate to be able to do this work. And I, I'm happy, happy to be here, and I'm happy you're awake this late at night. Because normally when we share with people, Willie and I get to share with a lot of people, it's a little bit earlier. So if anybody feels the need to nod off, I understand. I'll just raise my voice a bit. No, I won't be offended. I'll start dancing and saying, which will really wake you up. <laughs> But uh, you had Sister Florence with you last night, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Good friend of mine, fellow woman warrior, who is absolutely tremendous. I feel a bit guilty, though, because when I talked to her yesterday, she said, I'm busy just polishing off my speech. I was like, oh, dear. It is, you know, I don't have a speech ready for you. Um, but I do have um, an incredible journey that I've shared with a lot of people. And what I want to do is bring those people to you. One of them is Willie really Fontenot.
me. Everything <laughs> has a deep meaning, right? I mean, we get the meaning that the straws who and who bill is the one that really made the difference when we joined hands. And I moved from Mothers Against Air Pollution. I hope I'm kind of making sense because you get more than years out. It might take a while. Um, we, I went to a, a statewide conference right here at Louisiana State University with Lois Gibbs and Will Collette, who is still my mentor. And uh, we had a two and a half day conference with people from all over the state, much like you guys are getting uh, together from all over the United States. And isn't it a good feeling? Mm -hmm. yeah. Meet other people, you're like, hey, you're not crazy, and my God, you're having the same problem I'm having, and you know, apathy, and problems, and people. And so at the end of that two and a half days, which Willie is a founding member of Lean, we didn't want that feeling of unity and strength to end, and we didn't want to keep reinventing the wheel. Because we found out that it was working in one parish, or your county, uh, you know, somebody else might have a similar problem, and they might not know what to do, but the other folks might know what to do. So, at that time, I really collaborate this with me. We probably had three to five formally organized groups, and out of that um, organization, that little meeting here at LSU, uh, Lean was born. We were born. We usually have a birthday cake at our Lean conference, and uh, 14 years later, we had 85 member groups. We networked with 100 groups all over the uh, south. Some up, up the river, the Mississippi Basin Alliance. We're we're proud to uh, join hands with a lot of people who are trying to do good work. Um, we, some lady in the back, Laura. Hey, Laura, asked me like, who are you? What do you do? Do you work on forestry issues? That's great if you work on forestry issues, but I feel that we work on health issues, environmental justice issues, things that that affect us every day. And what we want is clean air and clean land and clean water. And we feel like our basic civil rights are being violated every single day that we're here. When we started out in 1987, doggone it, I should have brought it to you, but Charles Flanagan's going to talk to you and tell you the millions and millions of pounds that you breathe and drink when you're here. It is staggering. I hate to do that. Sometimes I think that's what makes our food so good. I'm not really sure. <laughs> but people want to know, have you done any good? Have, folks like us done any good, if you actually look at the chart, we moved down to about, how many are we this year? 50 million pounds 172. overall. Huh? 172. 172, thank you. 172. Uh, Ascension Parish has 50 million pounds. Um, okay, that's Pat Mahan in the back, our communication director. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Well, how many do you have in our area? Do you, do you remember? Baton Rouge and Bet well. Lots, too yeah. many. <laughs> so, so we're working on it. Pardon? 50 million pounds of what? Toxic release inventory. Toxic releases, okay. I'm sorry. TRI, toxic okay. release inventory. And so I found out that, you know, we're breathing toxic chemicals <laughs> every day on a daily basis. <laughs> and if you look at a graph, we're disproportionately higher. And I'm sure Sister Florence shared with you last night that people of color are often disproportionately impact. We started talking and lean about environmental justice before there was such a word as environmental justice, actually. We wrote it into our first proposal. We just knew that when we went, particularly along between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, that 150-mile stretch with more than 350 chemical facilities, that we were hearing the same stories, you know, high rates of cancer, respiratory illnesses, the rashes again, uh, asthma, the air so bad, children are so lethargic they can hardly play, um, over and over. And these people weren't talking to one another. So people called it anecdotal stories, but when the numbers started coming out, we realized that um, this is something that's truly happening to us. I'm going to let Willie come help me a little bit, but um, Lean works on, we worked on Shintech. You've heard about Shintech maybe, the $700 million PVC facility. We worked on that in two and a half years. We're working on the, the uh, where it wants to locate over in Plaquemine. We're involved in some legal suits about the non-attainment issue. Um, the air's been unhealthy to breathe several times already this year, and People think it may be over 30 times, actually, that people who have respiratory problems and asthma really shouldn't go out and particularly exert themselves <coughs> in any way. So um, we provide organizing assistance, which we can talk about more, technical assistance. We have a chemical engineer on staff. We have Charles Flanagan, who you're going to meet, who's a photographer. I'm so proud to say that name now. We call him Matt Man, though. He <laughs> makes maps. And a picture is truly worth a thousand words. When he comes to you and shows you the zone of impact, in a community, it is truly staggering. And what you can't forget, what I hope is a, what we're best at, is this is really about people. It's about people like my son. My son's best friend died um, January. I find it very difficult to talk about it. He had an inoperable brain tumor. 
He found out when he was 17, and he died when he was 19. And I have no doubt that this is happening to us at extraordinarily high rates, clusters of leukemia, clusters of inoperable brain tumors, because of the kind of exposure we have. So people say to me, how can you do this? How can you do this, really? How can we not do this? How could I not do this? How could I not try to hold the people who are doing this to us accountable? And we're very creative about it. And I'd be happy to share with you about how we march, prayer vigils. We just gave a pig to Exxon. I mean, uh, you got to have a little fun in this work, right? Because it's serious, serious stuff. I mean, don't ever forget when you're out there that you're representing a lot of people. I feel that I am. And it's serious, serious stuff. But we need to have fun. Because we don't have a little fun. We brought bagels to you guys. We brought a... Yay! Because um, truthfully, life is, is short, and I, everybody in this room has chosen to make a difference. Each one of you has a special gift. I'm serious, that nobody else has. Maybe you're not going to continue to work on the environment, but find out what that special gift is and always have what you have now, which is the desire to make a difference. It's so important. It's so easy to become apathetic. It's so easy to believe that the odds are too big. When we started the Shintex struggle, back to the S word again, they told us we could not win in St. James Parish. It wasn't possible. The money was in place, the politics was in place, and Willie, it's not true. Mary Lee, it's not true. We really believe in the power of people to overcome great odds. It truly is often a David and Goliath fight, but now I'm not telling you that we didn't have a technical assistant you know, a chemical engineer, that we didn't have Tulane Environmental Law Clinic following along. Like making a cake or having an orchestra. You guys like music? We are just talking about soul song. I'm more into something like Dave Matthews, but, you know, a great <laughs> band. You know, you lose your drummer, it's not going to sound the same. So you got to have all those pieces. You're not really sure sometimes which one of those pieces is going to be the thing. When you're organized, that you're going to win. But you sure as hell better have those pieces. And it sometimes means, we can talk about that too, but you may not like the people you work with. Sometimes you know, I like your sister, you're not going to like your brother. And when you come into that meeting, if you're the leadership, one, it behooves you to know what motivates them to be there, why they're there, and what's the best thing they can do, and forget about the other stuff. Some of my ladies are pro-choice. Some of my ladies are pro-life. Some of my ladies are not used to working with black folks. Some black people are not used to working with white folk. But our organization is about building bridges, and you, as leaders, should be about building those bridges. Because people are going to put up those walls, you believe it, right now. But if you believe that you can be a, build bri a bridge builder, get a little tongue tied there, it's really, really important. The power that you have as an individual, if you believe you can do it, like little Horton, is truly incredible. I've seen what people would think ordinary people do extraordinary things. People who don't have the benefit of the kind of education you, you folks have here. People who can barely read, people who can barely write, people who are people of color, people who are gay, people who are disabled. Whatever it is, whatever label that people want to put on to make them think that they can't get out of that box and do something, life will do it to you. But don't let them. And I'm here to tell you, because I was just a little mom who took an organization that had no money into six figures. We give away a portion of our money. I tied my money in bagels and fruit. <laughs> At best, in good people like you and the power that you have to make a difference. It is truly not a, a work for me at all. It is a lifelong, in the olden days, they called it a vocation. I'm Irish. I mean, it's a vocation. The priest said, you have a vocation, do you, child? It means that you have a calling to do something. And so I hope that you listen to whatever your calling is in yourself. Maybe you're going to be a doctor, maybe you're going to be a lawyer, maybe you're going to store Starbucks, maybe you're going to go to the trade center, I don't know. But whatever it is, damn it, be the best you can do at it. And, and learn and be open along the way too, because this journey doesn't just go here to here. You know? And then if you're like Willie and myself, you're going to carry a lot of people with you. 
Scott Welch is our board member who died at 32. Darnell Dunn died. Ramona Stevens, who started this work with me, died a year ago, last December 6th at 39 of lung cancer. Josh died at 19. Brother Pate died at 55 of bladder cancer. And while he was dying, he made me this wonderful sculpture that's in my office. I think Dave has seen it. And uh, he told me, please don't forget him. So I feel like I bring all those people in my pocket. No wonder I'm a little round, huh? <laughs> but I bring them to you because they don't have a voice that we can hear anymore. But those of us who are here must be their voice. So that's what you are called to do, I feel, to accept the mantle of being other people's voices and speaking out for the people who may not be able to speak out for themselves and may not have the advantages you have. Pretty serious stuff. Have a lot of fun. I guarantee you, your life will never be the same if you take up this kind of work. And we need you because you know what? They're saying out there on the media that young people don't give a damn. You're apathetic, spoiled. You hear it all. Just like my generation, we've got everything. You know, I should be like sitting by a pool and doing my nails, I guess, <laughs> looking for my Lexus or something. <laughs> I, I actually knew a car. Are you proud of me? Not too into the car thing. But the point being, you obviously are not. And that's, that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I hope you don't let life change that in you because you know what? Life needs you. We really need you. And what's happening to us here, how many of you are not from here? Wow! The start revolution! <laughs> okay, now a lot of folk not here. What's happening to me, and I'm personalizing it, and what's happening to us <coughs> is going to happen to you. What's in my neighborhood, his neighborhood, and Sister Florence's neighborhood is coming to you. And if we don't turn it around, and if we don't have help turning it around, we're not going to make it. I truly believe we won't make it. So, but seeing your bright faces, a few about a baby on fruit, Jason over there, committed. Working hard to make this happen, David. I think we can. I am what I call a realistic optimist. I'm realistic about the odds I'm up against. I work like hell, but I'm always optimistic because the magic about life is you just never know who you're going to meet and what you're going to do and how it's going to make a difference. And sometimes you're not going to see that difference for a really long time. That's something tough about this work. You might not see the shape in his head. You know what I'm talking about, huh? Mm -hmm. You go home at night and say, oh, shit, I don't get anything done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> People are arguing, and blah, blah. You know, what, what did that accomplish? And, the, and, the, and the, uh, everything, so, you know, everything's against us, blah, blah, blah. Really have faith. Have faith in yourself. Find trusted advisors. Find mentors. There's one lady rolling her eyes over there. But I, but I hope that that will be true. That you find someone to, that can motivate you, help you, it's kind of like the kindergarten rules, you know? Mm -hmm. Hold hands before you cross the street. Hold hands before you cross the street. Well, I hope I haven't taken up too much time. And I'm happy everybody's still awake. Oh. That's a good thing. And I'm really a, a late night person, so this is great for me. I wish everybody would ask me to come speak at 8.15 or 9 o'clock. That's, that's, that's great for me. Don't ask me to come 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. Sister Alberta wants to call me like at 6 or 7 o'clock. I said, no way. No <laughs> 3 o'clock in the morning, she calls a willy. And Sister Alberta is somewhere out there <laughs> circling. She's a wonderful person. I may have to tell you just about her if she doesn't make it here because she's so wonderful. But Willie, you want to, I've kind of uh, shared some of my stuff with you. Oh, you have questions? I sure hope so. Uh, I'll show him some yucky slides. And then He's going to show you some yucky slides. You're going to get to see up close and personal the uh, <laughs> visuals of uh, what it's like to be here. Right, Willie? Heidi has a question. Are you statewide or... Yes, we're a statewide group, and we, we try to identify ourselves in that we're the only homegrown environmental group here. We have really, other than a partnership with uh, like a national group like the Super Basin Alliance, we're not affiliated in any way. In other words, we're not a chapter of anyone. Um, I think we're pretty unique. When we started in 1986, there were several other groups, such as ourselves, but very few of them exist anymore. They, they have a little coin for it called, called Larger Than Local, because normally in the funding world, it's been national groups, our local groups, and so we really had to fight hard. And I, excuse me, man, I love men. I love men. And David, you know, I love you, David. Got a big man, Jason. 
But um, and they're doing something. And, uh, but it was hard, believe it or not, when I started Ladies as Staff. There were not any women doing what I was doing. Can you believe that? Lois, <coughs> who did Love Canal, was doing this. Maybe one other woman out of New Jersey. Yeah, one tough woman out of New Jersey. Doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a tough Jersey woman. Who um, was Madeline? Madeline Hoffman. Yeah, exactly. She's probably still hanging tough up there. Yeah, she, is. she is? Okay. Penny Newman. <coughs> Pardon? Penny Newman, Penny Newman in California. But when we can name them, like right on a few hands. So one of the things I felt obligated about was to nurture women in leadership. And uh, I don't know if it's true, ladies. We could have a whole other session about the, the myth of sisterhood, whether or not we really help each other as sisters. People who are out in uh, corporate life sometimes find that that's not true. But um, in Lean, we're really committed to help folks who might not ordinarily be encouraged. You ladies probably don't need any encouragement, but I need an encouragement. And I needed mentors, and I needed role models, and I need people to help me. And uh, when I first started, uh, foundations weren't really too happy about finding a woman in leadership. So I'm happy that I'm still here and that they had faith in me. And I, I, no offense to you men, I love you men. You're great. We need all of us. But the point being that there weren't women, and now there is a place in staff, because before when you go into community, I'm sitting at a kitchen table with women, moms, kids, usually the dads are out working, etc. And then, but as you moved up to the legislature or to staff level, there weren't too many women. So I just had to put that plug into uh, how we sisters have to help one another. Okay, Lou? You ready? Wisconsin and works in Madison. Hey, Jim. Minneapolis. Hey, Jim, give us a round of applause. Jim and I did a, a, a drive from here to New Orleans today. Uh, what's, what's that guy's name? Dave Perner. Dave Perner. Dave Perner. Any of you know who Dave Perner is? Yeah. Some guy sings. Soul Asylum. Yeah. Run away. He, he wanted to see what Louisiana looked like, so we gave him a classic turn. I'll show you some of my slides. Uh, the slides focus on uh, really Southern University, which is in North Baton Rouge. Uh, Florence Robinson teaches there, and is probably the most uh, impacted university in the United States from industrial facilities and waste sites. And uh, it's the second largest uh, predominantly black university in the United States. It used to be the largest, and Howard in Washington, D.C. is now the largest. And, and I've been doing this sort of work now uh, for a bunch of years as a volunteer um, since uh, about 1969 when I got out of college. And uh, in, in, the, in the last 30 years, I've helped to organize something around 500 groups across the country. A lot of those in Louisiana, and, and Lean was one of the groups I helped organize. <coughs> Mayor Lee Orr was the first president of the Mississippi River Basin Alliance when we formed that group. Uh, how many years ago? Five? Is that fifth year? What? Seventh year? Seventh year. Seventh year. Yeah, see, you can clock when you're having fun. Uh, I'm, I'm currently serving as vice chair of the <coughs> Mississippi River Basin Alliance. I'm on Lean's board. I'm on a board of a group called the Labor Neighbor Project, which is very unique in the United States. We're a labor union that's 
20 miles south of here is doing community organizing work on community issues. And uh, they're doing that because they were locked out of uh, BASF Corporation's you know, big chemical plant down in Geismar for five and a half years, and Lean was the only uh, citizen group that helped them. And uh, we helped them develop an environmental program where they went in and challenged permits of facilities all over the state. And so they sort of realized they were separated from the community, so they, uh, every month they uh, now take $5 out of their paycheck, which goes to fund community organizing work, and that's all 500 and something members of the union, so that's not bad when you get uh, 500 people to contribute, uh, oh, what's that, 60 bucks a, a year or whatever to uh, support community organizing. It's a pretty big deal. And they've been doing that now since, um, oh, what's it been, mm, about 15 years. <coughs> Great. Um, so anyway, the job I have is very unusual. I've been doing it for 22 years now. Uh, there's one other position like this in the United States, and that's in West Virginia. And it was created by statute, and uh, it is in the Department of Environmental Protection. Are any of you from West Virginia? Okay, that's all right. And there's a person in St. Louis who does some of this type of work uh, out of the mayor's office to help organize neighborhood groups and get them to work together. So uh, I'll show you my yucky slideshow. And and, uh, the most recent group that I helped to do some organizing on was the uh, Green Party of Louisiana. And uh, where's Billy? Billy's here. Billy. Billy. Uh, he came up from the office, and, and Billy is a senior in high school and been very active in helping to, to try and form the Green Party. And uh, he's got a NATO list of students. Yeah, yeah. 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 Holden from Factory Mayor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. don't know Kip Holden. He's, um, probably the best environmental legislator in the United States. He's African American from North Baton Rouge. Lawrence is legislator. Kip what? Kip Holden. H-O-L-D-E-N. For mayor. He's <laughs> 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 small contribution of a dollar or more. <laughs> so tomorrow night when we have a meeting. Uh, so I'll show you my yucky slideshow and then you can eat alcohol so you can ask some questions or or go take a tour or whatever. Um, how am I doing, Dave? Great. Right. Let's see how this works. Oh, that's not the light. That's the fake light. That's the fake light. Anyway, uh, Louisiana is, is known for its uh, uh, swamps, and these are some areas just south of here. Um, and some of its wildlife. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you betcha. Oh, yeah. and they always look kind of hungry. Great music. This is one of the marching bands down in New Orleans. And this is one of the Cajun bands down in Homa, Louisiana. Uh, and great food. Oh, yeah. some oil crawfish and a little crawfish etouffee. Mm -hmm. This is Mrs. Dusenberry who's fishing this up. Wonderful woman. This is Representative Kip Holden. When the Jaguars from the Southern University of Clay Kip's get up, gets out front, there's a little bar called Holden's Powerhouse. And you'll see him out there barbecuing and sipping his Budweiser and waving. <laughs> <laughs> we had some great uh, scenic beauty. Uh, uh, Jim and I went by Oak Alley Plantation today, and Zeb Mayhew wasn't there. He's the owner, and that's a whole other story. But uh, this is down about halfway between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Uh, a wonderful place, uh, unless you were a slave there, of course. <laughs> and this is Laura Plantation. Uh, it was pretty run down when they took this, and they have since uh, refurbished it. And this is where Joel Chandler Harris apparently picked up the stories from Senegal slaves, or slaves from Senegal, uh, that became the tales of Uncle Remus that later um, uh, Walt Disney turned into sort of a <laughs> whole another level of Burr Rabbit and Burr Fox. But this is where the tales of Burr Rabbit and Burr Fox came from, large plantations. And uh, a lot of our historical sites uh, have been lost in Louisiana and disappearing at this incredible rate. Uh, and these are some slave cabins from Papadora Plantation, which is across the river from Baton Rouge. And a lot of these cabins have fallen down since I took this photograph. Uh, 
the cabins in the front were built about 1870, and the ones on the other side of the water tower were built about 1850. Um, this is shot on the Mississippi River. Uh, here by Baton Rouge, the river is about 2,000 feet wide and 130 feet deep, more or less. And what you see there is two thirds of the flow of the Mississippi River. The other flow, uh, about a third of the river, flows down the Atchafalaya, which is a major distributary uh, channel of the Mississippi River. <coughs> and uh, there's a lot of barge traffic. You know, we have grain that comes down from the Midwest, a lot of coal. Montana and other places, and uh, uh, this is a big ocean-going ship up here by the Exxon Refinery. This is actually 200 miles from the mouth of the river where the father is in the port with sea-going ships in the U.S. And uh, this is looking south in Baton Rouge, the uh, kind of little red area that's down near the bottom of the slide, that's at Southern University. The campus or some of the buildings just right at the bottom slide or, or some of the dormitories and apartments at Southern University on the Mississippi River on the right, and a whole bunch of industries looking down toward Baton Rouge, and we're right now up at the top of the slide where we're sitting here. Um, and this is some of uh, Exxon Refinery, which is a uh, uh, fairly large oil refinery here in Baton Rouge. So the Exxon has a larger one at Baytown, Texas. Near Houston, this one processes they will process about 400,000 barrels a day, and I think in Baytown it's going to be 500,000. And uh, it's the largest source of, of air pollution in uh, East Baton Rouge Parish, where we sit. Uh, this is uh, a fire that took place at Exxon in 1989. It was Christmas Eve. Patrick's dad was working at the refinery that day. Uh, they had a gas line that leaked. It gotten down to 8 degrees Fahrenheit the night before, which shows you from the north that's not very cold, but that happens here about once every 50 or 60 years. And uh, this is a shot through the uh, cabins at Poplar Grove to the Exxon Fire across the river. Uh, I'm about a mile from the refinery right here. And this is the state capitol level, white building on the right, and <laughs> Exxon burning on the left. It's pretty, pretty incredible. This is about 11 o'clock in the morning of Christmas Eve. And uh, heard this explosion. It was pretty awesome. After that explosion, Exxon started buying out homes in a very large area around it. It's currently the largest buyout in Louisiana, the uh, Garden City area, which is across uh, Scenic Highway from uh, the refinery. That's the name of the road on the side of Exxon. And this is a shot of Montesano Bayou, which is the last free-flowing stream that enters the Mississippi River 200 miles before it goes into the Gulf of Mexico. It flows through all of these chemical plants and one of the more polluted waterways in the state. And uh, Montesano Bayou is entering the Mississippi River at the top left of the screen. And kind of uh, at the bottom of the screen is a little white area flowing into this pond. That's water from the Mississippi River. The river has risen up. and Mississippi River water is flowing back into this waste pond at Formosa Plastics. Uh, so here in high water, waste uh, river water can get into, into waste. The area of this photograph right here has groundwater contamination with trichloroethylene and ethylene dichloride and a few other things that go down more than 400 feet below the surface. And so it's basically traveling under the Mississippi River. And this is a shot of um, stuff of chemical, which is now rhodia, and this is, uh, you may have heard the controversy where the company wanted to burn uh, napalm as a supplemental fuel. This uh, is a company that produces sulfuric acid by burning high sulfur content material, and the, the material they burn is listed as a hazardous waste, so they have to get a hazardous waste permit. And this is located one mile from Southern University. Uh, and the university was very upset about uh, that. The, the rhodia plant is kind of in the middle and to the right on the screen. Um, and there's a, a highway and bridge that go across the Mississippi River. You see the Mississippi River cutting across the top of the screen. And uh, rhodia also has an artificial vanilla plant. And then Southern University is just off the top of the screen. You can kind of see the red pit up in the top right hand corner that was in one of the earlier photographs. Uh, this is kind of looking at over Southern University, looking south, you see the bridge crossing the Mississippi River. Uh, and a 
couple of years ago, a barge coming around the river at this point uh, in high current, several barges broke away from what's called the tow, where there are lots of barges together, hit the one of the supports on the bridge, flipped over, and for about a week we had this blue haze or cloud that just drifted up and down the river back and forth. They evacuated or had early closure at Southern University twice. Uh, all the schools in downtown Baton Rouge, about 30 schools were dismissed early a couple of days. Uh, it was pretty bad. So anyway, Southern University is down at the bottom of the screen. And you know, it's kind of nice. It's sitting on a bluff over the Mississippi <coughs> River. Um, and this is sort of a shot with the red mud pit. We're over the Mississippi River, which is, you can see the bottom of the river down there in the left-hand corner. And Southern University was a dome stadium and other things. And then you can see the Exxon tank farm over in the far distance. Now that tank farm, that's where they store gasoline and oil and stuff. That has been dismantled in the last year. But there are other industries over to the left. What was the red pit? That's waste from Kaiser Aluminum. Uh, in, in East Baton Rouge Parish, the industrial zone ends right at the Southern University boundary. So they basically could have put a giant chemical plant right there, but instead they put a waste pit. Uh, also, the, the barge spill in, in the blue haze was from benzene. Well, it was uh, uh, pyloric gasoline, which is about 30% benzene. Yeah, it was pretty bad stuff. This is on the southern campus. You're at a point here where you're uh, about 40 feet higher than the river and about 82 feet above sea level. Uh, we're pretty flat down here. The highest point being in Mount Driscoll in North Louisiana, which is about 500 feet above sea level. People from New Orleans get dizzy when they go up there. <laughs> Really nice place because the river does a 90 degree turn right at Southern University. Uh, but right across from Southern, this is kind of looking back at Formosa Plastics and Kaiser and some others. Uh, a lot of waste has been dumped here. This is a shot I took in 1981 uh, when I went out with a couple of film crews and we found uh, PCBs, pollinated, pollinated, polychlorinated biphenyls, and right at this spot, in this Mississippi River water up there. Uh, about 500 parts per million, which is uh, pretty high. And this is Mississippi River water wash, washing up in one of these dump sites across the river from Southern University. Uh, this point on the Mississippi River um, is called, now called Wilkinson Point. A few years ago, it was called Free Negro Point uh, after some uh, free people of color, as they were called, um, immigrated from New Orleans and settled across the river from Baton Rouge. But on the original uh, navigation charts, this was called Free Nigger Point, and that was changed in the 60s uh, after civil rights came in. And Wilkinson Point, or Free Negro Point, is across the river where it's southern again, over on the left, and on the right is Devil's Swamp, which is an overflow swamp in the Mississippi River. Right here, the river here in high water is about 3,000 feet wide, <coughs> from southern over to Wilkinson Point. And up at Devil's Swamp, the river flows across that swamp as sheep flow. And the river at that point is five miles wide because there are no flood, flood protection levees around Devil's Swamp. Uh, this is uh, looking uh, north at Devil's Swamp, the Mississippi River on the left, and Southern University would be over on our right, right out of the picture. It's uh, about five or about 8,000 acres. This is over the swamp looking south, and Southern University is uh, about, you can see the white dome of the university, kind of just to the left of the water. That's a, a canal called Baton Rouge Barge Canal. And this area has uh, some spots with dead trees in it. Those trees down at the bottom, uh, these are cypress trees that are about 1,800 to 1,000 years old that have been killed by this toxic waste. Uh, Meredith mentioned uh, Mr. Pate, who died of uh, bladder cancer. This is Ms. E.W. Pate in the boat on the left, back in the swamp, helping a crew from ABC. They did a, a, a shot of the swamp that's about an 800-year-old cypress tree that's sitting on that was killed by this toxic waste that was dumped in the swamp. And uh, this is a, one of the dump sites uh, where in 1981, uh, EPA uh, contractor did some sampling and right at the, it's a road there that kind of goes to the top of the picture. And it's 
see some Mississippi River water in there, I believe. But uh, down 80 feet below the surface, they found the water sample is what they called it. It was 73% toxic waste. It was 732,000 parts per million of chlorinated hydrocarbons. Uh, 350,000 parts per million of trichloroethane, 250,000 parts per million of ethylene dichloride, 92,000 parts per million of hexachlorobutadiene and some really minor stuff like 13,000 parts per million of carbon tetrachloride. <laughs> and about, oh, several hundred chemicals. And U.S. Justice wrote our office a letter and said that those were the highest levels of toxic chemicals they'd ever found in any site in the United States, um, including Love Canal. These were like off the charts. And this is an overflow swamp of the Mississippi River. The river's at the top of the screen, and every year, Twice a year, the river would flood this waste site and wash the waste out. Yeah. And uh, this is some of the waste that is extruding out of the ground uh, next to my little pen there. It's just uh, plastic waste, and it's mixing with some of the waste mixing together, some of it mixing with oil, and it just expands. And, and it's basically extruding waste coming through toxic waste. It's kind of an interesting mix. Uh, this is stuff where there was nothing obvious on the ground, no barrels or anything, but this is some really serious stuff as it's waste coming out of the ground. Uh, and these are some of the cattle. Uh, in, in the winter of 69-70, uh, the Yules, who the cattle farm next to uh, Devil Swamp lost, uh, uh, about 170 head of cattle. They had walked down in the swamp. They wintered down in there because they were protected from the cold. Uh, the pit broke open, and they were sloshing around in this waste that got all over them. Uh, they drank it, and they couldn't eat anymore, and they starved to death over about a two-week period. Uh, and the Yules lost cattle in this swamp every year um, from that site and, and two other dump sites. And the cattle could just walk right down in the waste. Pretty bad place. Uh, this little calf that didn't make it. Um, and from the Rollins site that Florence had talked about, a whole lot of fish died out in here in Devil Swamp. I said the place got so bad even the devil left. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, a sort of ominous little sign. This is a mockingbird that I saw one day swinging. The, the wind was blowing. This little dead mockingbird was clenched onto the wire, just swinging back and forth like a little sign. Of, All ye beware or something. And uh, this is the defense of, of petrol processes, and that's Reynolds Metal, which is a petroleum coke plant. And over on the left is School Hill, which is a lead smelter, which you can't see. Uh, and this is all about a mile from where Florence Robinson used to live. This is Darnell Dunn, who worked at School Hill, which is a lead smelter. And he was on Lean's board. He was the president of the steel workers at School Hill and was killed when a door of a freight car uh, he was trying to open, it was rusted shut, and he turned around to get a crowbar, and the door fell off and crushed it. Uh, the door weighed about 1,500 pounds. And he was like one of the most incredible labor activists in Louisiana, really wonderful. And you guys know this is a power plant that was like an actual... I'm sorry? There's no power plant involved with that door coming off or anything. The union did investigate. They were not comfortable. No. It was... They, they, they were not happy. It was, a, a, it was a really bad tack welding that was done on this door. It was a very old car. It should have been taken out of service. Uh, it was really bad. Six, five, 500 people went to this funeral, right? Yeah, they shut down the school. The only time I've seen this, they shut the um, uh, lead smelter down for two days for his funeral service. Everybody was on. Um, I'm trying to orient myself. I'm legally blind, I don't have any central vision, so I saw like seeing my slides. Um, the, the gray stuff in the middle, or kind of blue stuff, that's coke dust, petroleum coke dust coming out of Reynolds. Uh, to the right of that is the lead smelter. And the, and the coke facility is the largest emitter of particulates or particles in East Baton Rouge Parish. And, and 10 miles away, you can get black city stuff in your doggy dish. And uh, then in the, in, uh, no, I'm sorry, the lead smelter's on the left. And then on the right is a big pit where they were going to bury uh, waste from the Petro cleanup. And Petro is in the foreground. It was a 52-acre site where just tons of waste were done. And then it's kind of a little 
uh, orange built-in kind of a dome over on the right, top right of the screen. And that was a, a, a facility called Union Tankar, which was a dime by Buckminster Fuller and built in the mid-50s. And there was another one built up in Minnesota uh, for working on railroad cars. And it's got a, it's a geodesic dome design. It's the largest free-span dome in the world. It was built in the uh, octagon shapes uh, metal uh, support structures all on the outside. So it's a pretty important historical site. And this is a petrol process that's cleaned up. <coughs> Exxon and Dow uh, agreed in a court order to clean the site up, and, and there are about 14 other companies. And they said that uh, it would cost about $13 million to clean the site up, um, and they would clean it up. They've spent about $150 million so far. Uh, there's a whole, these little green buildings are where pumps are, and they've got about 300 pumps out there pumping chemical waste out of the ground. This, and they bring it to an oil water separator or a stripper, run the water through a carbon filter and they take the waste out and burn it and incinerate it. Which oh. is maybe not an improvement, but that's what they're doing. They estimate it'll take about 200 years to clean the site up. And they'll still have about 60% of the waste in the ground. But they're not dealing with the two to 3,000 acres of swamp that is contaminated. And this is just another shot of the, the petrol site. With the little warning sign. Uh, this is one of the warning signs in the swamp. And this looks pretty informative. It's got non-literate, uh, no fishing, no swimming. You know what those mean. It tells you a little bit about the chemicals and uh, it's pretty serious stuff. Uh, this is the first high water after they put the signs up because they put this in an overflow swamp in the midst of the river. And it's a little hard to read. Uh, this is the next year. Uh, and uh, this is what the signs looked like in 1989. And uh, they're not out there anymore because some guys stole them because they're aluminum. Took them to the scrapyard. Uh, but they weren't doing any good anyway. So just because they put up really good signs doesn't always help. Uh, a few years ago, EPA was doing some testing out in the swamp, and they wrote a letter to the Food and Drug Administration and said that we just want to let you know that more than 500 pounds of crawfish are being harvested daily in the area of concern. That means the area where they were finding contamination, a euphemism, uh, and being sold commercially somewhere. We don't know where. Uh, we thought you'd like to know about it. So what you eat uh, may be make a difference. And these are some folks uh, in, down in San Gabriel who are organizing to fight supplemental fuels, which is a hazardous waste blending plant. Uh, one of the groups that uh, Mary Lee uh, worked, spent a lot of time working with, they were a member group of Lean, and they successfully stopped the, the facility at one of the few times when the state denied the permit for a facility in Louisiana. And uh, it's a great group to work with, called Neighbors Assisting Neighbors. Uh, and they're still down there causing trouble. This is a group we worked with a bunch of years ago up in Homer, Louisiana, that opposed a uh, uranium enrichment plant. This was actually the group that fought the low-level radioactive waste disposal site. And then they helped work to fight a uh, uranium enrichment plant in North Louisiana. It's the only time that the Atomic Energy, or Nuclear Regulatory Commission, rather, uh, or any agency has ruled on an environmental justice complaint, and they mm -hmm. said that the uh, Urenco, which was proposed in the plant, had failed to consider the impact that the uranium enrichment plant would have on the two African American neighborhoods that would be uh, divided by the uh, uranium enrichment plant. These are some folks who fought Rollins. This was when they were proposing to burn the PCBs uh, that got the early started in the environmental movement. And uh, these are some folks who were fighting uh, grain dust handling uh, south of here in a little small town. And the problem with the grain dust is that, is that they load it too fast, it creates a lot of dust, blows off out of these ships and barges, gets in the community, and all this dust settles on people's houses and cars, and it's kind of like if you've ever made glue with flour, it becomes paste and it hardens on your vehicle, it gets in your lungs, it gets in eyeballs, it gets in everything, and little kids have terrible, terrible asthma problems from here. Uh, this is a protest in front of the governor's mansion, and that's Florence Robinson. And I think, who else is in there? Mary Lee? Brian. Mary Lee is in there. Alberta Haston.
This is Amos Faberite, who is um, one of the founding members of Lean. He's an old civil rights activist in Geismar. And uh, at one point, he found out that his union rep at, at Armet Aluminum was the head of the local Ku Klux Klan cell. And he was wondering why he was getting bad representation from his union. And uh, he, uh, he sued both the union and, and the aluminum company and won both of those civil rights cases. And his daughter was the first black student to integrate the all-white public school system in forced integration in 1968. And she went on to graduate from Louisiana State University in art and taught my kids art and lots of other folks. And Malika Faberite, if you ever see her work, it's pretty wonderful stuff. Uh, and this is Amos down in Geyser during the toxic march that we had from Baton Rouge in New Orleans a bunch of years ago. And uh, this is uh, this is Wilfred Green who died a couple of years ago, last year. Uh, he was a retired school principal who fought for most of plastics. It was the first time we stopped a new, it was, this was a seven or eight hundred million dollar uh, rayon plant from locating uh, in between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And Mr. Green owned the land along the river that was worthless uh, until this company wanted a place that had deep water access because his property, the river scoured out and where Formosa owned the property, the river put all of its silt. And he absolutely refused. He, he had emphysema and, and he said something like, uh, he always spoke very soft because of the emphysema. He said, we cannot have equity, but we can have justice. Mm -hmm. He was a tough guy. I mean, he, he was really bad. Here's Mr. Green talking to a group of engineers from seven African countries who all spoke French and English. And they couldn't understand why somebody would be opposed to a, um, an industrial facility in their neighborhood, because they're from places like Nigeria, and they're trying to attract industries to their country. And they were really perplexed by Mr. Green. And this is Dan Nikolai on the right, so you won't be confused, and Alberta Hastings on the left. And this is them plotting and scheming about something, right? <laughs> Dan, Dan has uh, worked as the director of the Labor Neighbor Project, which is a group I was telling you about a little early, and Alberta, who has just arrived, is a uh, member of the Hibbyville Parish School Board. She's on the board of Lean, and she's on the board of the Labor Neighbor Project, and the head of a group called Louisiana Communities United, and she is taking names and picking up. <laughs> and this is a group of folks, when we first formed, at a press conference at the state capitol, and we have Representative Kip Holden and Senator Cleo Fields, who are in this photo with a bunch of troublemaking women. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that is Florence Robinson in the bottom right, eating crawfish down at the feet. And that's Bill Redding, who works for the Sierra Club in Madison, Wisconsin, in the red t-shirt, a red shirt. And Bill is also a, a president of the Mississippi River Basin Alliance. And this is Kip Holden. <laughs> Glad to go back inside and get out of the heat here in a minute. Who is, and this is uh, one of our marches, and people are out there doing stuff, and this is the end of the march. All right, there you go.
you have to look at the whole picture. And no longer can we say we're being intimidated or manipulated, but we have to be educated. And knowledge is power. And with all what you've seen here tonight was a team. It was a team coming together to make a difference. No matter how hard it was, bending and bowing, cussing and fussing, <laughs> fighting, we hung in there together. Because that was teamwork. Versity, teamwork, and that was history making. And I want to challenge you all to continue doing history. Because you see, you may talk about me, and you may do anything you want to. But we still going to rise, not by one, but together. We will rise, we will rise, we will rise. Woo!
come up with their own way of doing things, their own their own style, their own way of using the information that we give them, and that's so important that it's their ideas and their. Uh, she's got something already, but th there's not one. You know, it's there's that's why there's a lot of books about it. You know, it's difficult to organize. It's it's difficult to know what will work, and that's why you as core leadership are really important because sometimes it is just your gut. I mean, that's that's the theory. Sometimes it's your gut. You're just going to have a feeling that this action, you know, you, you, you get together as a group, you talk it over, you think about the consequences and what's going to come out of it. And, um, and it might, I have to tell you, and I, I didn't bring this into it, my work is faith-based. Um, uh, I meditate and pray a lot. So if, if David wonders where, what, what I get come from, it comes from something higher and bigger than myself. Whether you know you're Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, Judeo, oh, just the, the concept that something is bigger than yourself that would you mention. Some people don't want to hear that, so I don't really go into it a lot. But I, I think if, if you don't want to call it prayer, just certainly the wisdom within yourself that you reflect about what the consequences are of what each one of you are going to do, and um, empower people with information. I mean, often what our is sharing with you and Willie is that our folks down here. We have the uh, number one illiteracy, worst place to raise children, highest rate of children in poverty. Don't drink water. <laughs> High, yeah, yeah, it's really, so we, we have the challenges too of, of organizing folks who don't maybe not have, like I say, the advantages you guys have. And they go, oh, Does that yeah. not help you at all? To, not, not really, huh? But oh, sometimes oh, prayer, village, uh, prayer vigils, sometimes direct actions, and sometimes you got to know too in your gut when it's time to sit down with whomever that you're dealing with. And you have to decide as a group when, what is it that you really want? What is it that you want to get out of it when you go in there? And Lean often has had the reputation, we've been the organization when it's just, we're the one who gets up and walks. There's some people that are a bit more, I uh, use that word with Laura, a little bit more conservative than we are. And um, sometimes we come to the table and something productive, sometimes we have to come and say, you know, this isn't gonna work for our work and, and some of our folks, so we have to go off. But in the words of Malcolm X, whatever needs necessary, you have to do it. It comes from your heart and your work with your mind, but it's the spirit that connects. It's so amazing when Mary Lee be talking about the spirit, I was not the holy person. <laughs> Things came out of my mouth, Whoa. they had to pray for me. <laughs> but I learned, you know, she was saying, she was saying things that she believed. You have to believe and attach in what you're doing. And I would be here, I'd be saying, mm -hmm, yeah, whatever, sure, yeah. And then when you look, it actually happened. It takes somebody like me who came from the bottom and went up to the top. Somebody who had an election and had industry putting out the money. And all I had to do was stand up and I had to get the guts to stand up and say, I'm going to stand up and be a voice for the people. No green, mm -hmm. but the voice for the people. And that's what you have to remember. You're out here to represent. And are you ready to represent? Because it's time. You see, and that's when you think about it and you get people to encourage you, to build you up, you fired up then. <laughs> and nobody can hold you back. Because when it can be the governor, the president, he'll go knock on their door and tell them what you want. Don't care if they knock you down, get back up again because it's a task that you have in a goal that you're reaching out for. Taking somebody who come out of a small community with nothing and they came out with something, that's mm -hmm. making you feel good about yourself. And nobody would ever bring your motivation and self-esteem down because you know what you can do. So get busy, dog. Sister, <laughs> would you agree with this too? And once you learn to organize, and I hope we're helping you in some way, because please ask us questions if we're not, um, once you learn to organize on an issue, you can carry it over to any issue in your life. Once you're empowered, once you feel what Albert is talking about, I mean, she's remarkable. I swear to God, if we could bottle her and sell her, wouldn't it be great? I mean, she's so fantastic. She only ten pounds would be great. She's a lot of tons of fun. That's what she said. And it's okay. And, uh, it, well, there you go. But do you see what I'm trying to say, guys? Does this, does this help you a lot? Because I do encourage you to ask questions if we aren't clear. We've been doing this a, a little while. And um, 
But we have to sit down and be creative and think of different things. Dave, you got a question. Let me maybe add something to this. Um, there's a really good piece that I found a few years ago. It's a Japanese writer, and he wrote about the progression of environmental struggles in Japan, and it's one of the most uh, incredible uh, analysis of how struggles start or succeed or do not succeed. And, and you might want to write this down. The guy's name is John Ui, J-A-N-U-I. And it's uh, in Japan Quarterly. It's J-A-N-U-I, John Ui. I think it's correct. He still teaches at University in Okinawa. Uh, and, uh, but it's in the third quarter, fourth quarter, I think it's the third quarter of Japan Quarterly. It's the name of the public, like Japan Quarterly. Most universities have it. And it's uh, in 1972. If you go to, you know, periodical index, you can, you can find it. What's the title of it? It has a screwy title. It's the Singularities of something, or I, I don't know. It must have been lost in translation or something. Uh, and I found a reference to it in a book called The History of Environmental Law in Japan. It is a little little piece about this big and a rhythm. Wow, that makes sense. And he talks about how uh, in environmental struggles, if uh, in, in there's several things. One of them, there are no third parties or neutral parties. They're particularly university professors that come in and say they're going to mediate or be the, you know, wise. They're they're going to stay above the frame. You know what I mean? Well, <laughs> that anybody does that, it's, and he doesn't use the word the word racism, but it, it's implied in what he's writing. It's kind of like racism. If you the, the so disinterested or neutral third party, if you're not doing anything about it, then you're helping to make the pollution of the racism possible. Not that you have to get involved in every fight in the world to solve every problem, but you know, if you're living in a community and you're not doing something about the quality of life in your community and it's affecting you, then you've got to be really uh, either not connected or something, but by not doing anything, you're helping it to happen. When people find it, when people get involved in a community, if they've got a, a deteriorated condition or there's something that wants to come in that they don't want, if they just sit back and do nothing, what's going to happen, right? It's going to happen. But if they all get out in the street and start talking about it, talking to each other, form a group, do something, then things happen. Um, sorry. And he says that, that if you go about docilely through the process where you appeal to the local government, and then you appeal to the next level of government, and the next level, and you go through the courts and all that, and you go through it, and that's all you do. You say, oh, we're, we're going to be peaceful, and we're going to go through, and, and we're going to appeal to Judge Alberta, and appeal to Judge Mary Lee, and get it up to the Supreme Court to uh, uh, Billy over here or something. And, and, uh, and well, 10 years later, we're still fighting this struggle, and we haven't gotten anywhere. We're worn out. We've expended our resources. Mm -hmm. But if you figure out who is it that can give you what you want, who is causing the problem? And you go after the president of the company, you go after the banker that's funding the company, you go after the, uh, yeah, the governor or whoever it is, and you take them on directly. Don't, don't go through this process. You come out here and you go, and that's what, you can't wait and, you, and you have to be really creative. Every group I've ever worked with comes up with something that I would never think of doing in art, say, that'll never work. And they say, go in there. Say? Boom. Well, Every, I always said, Alberta, I'll never be able to do it. Well, what did you just say now? See, we're fixing to get into something deep here. Now, you say be creative. This man, who is a quiet one, like he was saying, said behind the scenes, you know, calls me up, get me stirred all up, get me all up, say, the quiet one. They call him the quiet one. You know, because he works in government. I know you told you he worked for the Attorney General office, didn't yeah. he? So when he, he sets in and he oh, reads the paper year. every day. Don't know how he read the paper because they say you can't see, but you still know everything in that paper. <laughs> so that is what he's doing. He's going to call you and say, hey, did you hear what happened in your community? And then you say, I ain't got time to read the paper. I'm not going to read the paper and watch the TV. Because that's the depressing. You see, that's, that's too depressing, so I don't be reading it. So he'll call and write that. I know you can pick up no paper and read it. So let me tell you what's happening in your community. So that just stirred me up. So I'm going to find five more people to stir up and get messy with. We call it getting messy. All right, that's not enough. He's going to say, well, if you need me, just, you know, come get me. So we're going to tell Mary Lee and Patrick, because neither one of us can drive, so we're going to tell them, come on, down here. Get in there. He's going to write it all up for you. 
And he sits back and he, he said, oh, there was some rowdy people going on up in there. <laughs> Started with us. <laughs> All the people sure was cutting up up in there. But you see, he's talking to the good guys. You know, the other guys, he played the devil's advocate with them. But you see, y'all need to watch what you're saying from these people because they're getting ready. Tomorrow we're going to put something in the paper on them. That's how you tell them. So that's how we work together. He's going to tell me, get in there and kick their butt. But he's going to tell them, oh, that's a shame what happened. You know? <laughs>
But 70 people showed up with t-shirts on, no power plant. They're fighting a, a clean, burning, state-of-the-art, gas-fired power plant. There are four of them proposed in their community. They're not going to burn. Huh? They're not going to burn and we're fighting in Pennsylvania too. Well, Good, I'd like to talk to you because we're well, fighting 16 what they, here. What they did, they all showed up. It was a done deal. They had all of their permits lined up. Uh, the first one was Clico. They're taking on an energy plant, and Duke Power is the one they're coming down on tomorrow. Uh, but the, at the first hearing, a couple of people got up and spoke in favor of the plant. They went to the next hearing, which was Thursday. Nobody got up in favor of the plant. And, and these folks are all showing up in their t-shirts, and, and it's really awesome. So they're coming down tomorrow to meet with the Department of Environmental Quality just to let them know they're alive. And, well, and because and, the DEQ rarely hears from people. <coughs> Uh, so they're trying all sorts of different things, and and, uh, and it all works. Willie, yeah. The last time you gave a slide presentation for Seek here at LSU, um, you you did talk a little bit about how things have changed. Um, I, I remember leaving that that slide presentation with a real feeling that you know in, in the 30 years or so that you've been doing this work, you've seen you've seen real change. It, where it, it wasn't being monitored at all before, and you saw a lot of nasty stuff. And you still see some, but at least it's. It's in, it's improving. I think that's that's something that's so important for us because you get bogged down and it, it has to stay balanced to really, even though it's not happening as fast as we want it to, you know, it, it's changing. It's happening. Well, it's happening a lot. There, there's another book you might look up uh, that was done. It's a Sierra Club book. It's, uh, the title of it is Deeper Shades of Green, and it's uh, there's some inaccuracies and in it. it gives me the wrong eye problem and a few things like that. But other than that, it's fine. But. Uh, it has, gives the Attorney General the wrong first name, but we won't worry about that. It's only a part of the Attorney General. Uh, but it's, it's sort of a, um, looking at a bunch of states around the country where people have gone through environmental justice fights, and it's about minorities and labor in the environmental movement. And it's a pretty good book. To, uh, it's Deeper Shades of Green by Jim Schwab, S-C-H-W-A-B. And he's from Chicago, and he wrote a chapter on Louisiana, and he sort of uses me to tie these different groups together. Um, and it, it'll sort of give you a sense of, of what people go through in some of these struggles. But it has changed a lot. I mean, some of the slides I showed you here are older. Uh, when I went out, I, I didn't have to leave the city of Baton Rouge to find big open sludge pits, um, things dying in those pits, but waterways leaving this university that were totally contaminated from waste being dumped by the chemistry lab the dairy barn, uh, and a bunch of other stuff, that, uh, the veterinary school, the, uh, the incinerator over here by the veterinary school where they had PCB contaminated transformers that people had knocked over <coughs> the copper out of, and PCB waste all down the waterways here. Um, had, one of the professors I worked with, he said, Willie, it's crazy. He said, I got these students, I'm trying to show them how to take water samples and where they can take them and how they can learn uh, how, how to identify pollution, he said, heck, they don't have to leave the campus. They go on the top end of the campus where water's coming into the university, and it's pretty clean by the time it leaves the university, right here. He says, and it's all contaminated. And if we go a mile south of here, then it gets all, because just south of us is the uh, LSU oil and gas field. It's an old field, there's still a few producing wells. But, I mean, this is a, a whole big old uh, laboratory right here, the University and City Park Lake System. Uh, we worked on it to try to improve the system and, and found something like 36 places where raw sewage was going into the lake system. And you wonder why they had fish kills two or three times a year. Uh, and, and nobody had documented it. And you know, people were fishing in it, swimming in it. I mean, the place where you kept the biggest catfish where the raw sewage was flowing into the lake because they had lots to eat. Mm. But, <laughs> I mean, we don't have a book. And it's not like that. It's improved a lot. Yes. And there's no book about what most of the struggles have been, no. but it gives you some of a sense. And every, every group I've worked with, uh, except for maybe I could count on one hand, uh, have succeeded in, in what they've done. I mean, Alberta talked a little bit about Shintech, but she's currently, she and, and uh, three or four women uh, have filed a lawsuit against the U.S. Environmental, no, against the Department of Environmental Quality. Quality against Shintech One Logan in St. James Parish and the local folks that we helped organize down there uh, got them out. They now want to locate near Alberta's home in a different parish. Yeah. That we <coughs> and the, the day before they were supposed to appear in court, the, 
the past president of Louisiana, Louisiana Trial Lawyers Association agreed to represent him in court. And he showed up. Here are the lawyers for the uh, Department of Environmental Quality, who's so supposed to be protecting us for all the big industries, uh, Chamber of Commerce. I don't know who else will talk, but lots of lawyers showed up. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and there's Alberta and Liz are sitting there in the courtroom going, oh, gosh, are we going to have a lawyer or what? And in walks this guy, and he's got you know, mega bucks from some big cases and stuff. And he sits down, and all the lawyers are going, but Jerry, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm here Rock representing uh, these two ladies. <laughs> no, okay. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> we had 20 lawyers. We had one lawyer. They're all scared. <laughs> they didn't know what to do. We paid for our fees to, you know, for the court room. But what was the funny thing? They had all kinds of papers, and we didn't have no paperwork. We didn't know the technical matters, and we had Lee to give us the high tech you know, that we had to do. All we did was say, it smells, <laughs> and, and we want to do something about it. And now from that, DEQ, you want you to call DEQ to put you on a little machine? They don't do that to us. <laughs> because we messed the machine up so bad, we burned it up. <laughs> so they don't learn to don't be put me on a machine no more. <laughs> and we hit EPA also with that because we let them know the people. You said, you know, you have freedom of speech, so we use it. I've heard of fax machines and telephones and anything else. But you know, we don't write this up in a book. But these are the things that we do to make a difference. And you know something working when you see them the next morning and you're going somewhere and they stop the calls to see where you're going. <laughs> you start wondering. When they see about two or three of us together, what they fix to do? <laughs> you know, they must be fixed to get into something. But um, it is a difference. It's a change coming. You know it's coming, and we're going to take it over. All of us going to take it over. inspirational demonstrations or protests that you did? The best one I like when I put the pig nose on. <laughs> <laughs> and the school board association called me up the next morning and said, I'm afraid that we've seen you in the paper, girl. <laughs> and you had this pig nose on, I said, next time come join me. <laughs> they gave me a thumbs up. And I said, next time join me. That was the best I, I enjoyed that. <laughs> and the, one, the next one I, was when we went to the governor's house in my my son, which at that time was nine years old, and he had grown up around all of this. And he was little, and they had fixed him up with a flag and a black shirt. And we were all walking, going to the, I think you've seen the pictures. We were going to the governor's mansion. The governor put a fence up there for us now. Yeah. Because Wilbur knocked on the door and said, I want to speak to the governor. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the power. See, that's the power that you can give people. The incentive, the encouragement, and we were just ringing that bell down the governor and put this tall fence taller than me. I can't see him now. And, uh, but those are the things that you know when you're making a difference. And regular people, regular people every day are doing this, you know. Hey, could you say something about the <coughs> corporate heart at the trough uh, campaign? Because there's more of that coming, and some people have been out of town in Louisiana didn't get to do that. Early. It's the 10 year tax exemptions. <coughs> we're going to different parishes and picking the one who ha gets the most corporate tax exemptions. Here in Louisiana, the, the corporations don't pay school millages. There's no money that goes towards our schools, roads, or hospitals. So the first fat daddy pig of them all was Exxon, Big Fat Piggy. And uh, we had really a lot of fun. We got a trough, and we have a little pig, and it's got money coming out of its mouth. Pat did a great job. Want to tell what the pig looked like? And the balloons. There's a pig in a trough with money. <laughs> we were hollering, pig in the trough, money, money, earn, earn. And we delivered it to Exxon, and people had pig noses on and pig masks on, and I'm telling you, they, they freaked out. I have never seen so many cell phones, and I was talking to one, guy, I was talking to one guy, and the phone rang, and said, I cannot talk to you. I cannot talk to you. <laughs> They created 95 permanent jobs in the last 10 years that have costed more than $3 million per job to the folks here in East Baton Rouge Parish. We talked about how much money the schools didn't get, how much pollution Exxon has put out. It's one of the number one polluters right here in East Baton Rouge Parish. So 
will be delivering another pig, and I think they're real worried about where that pig is going to be. No. And the guy called a few of us into the, the little head. They wouldn't allow us in, by the way. They, they stopped us at the front. And he brought us in. He said, I just want you to know, no one is going to meet with you, and we're not going to take the pig. <laughs> <laughs>
We do, but they're not. They're not as um. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me, uh, uh, it's what you know. Uh, every state, there is not a state that's immune from this kind of stuff. Right. Uh, and I've worked in just about every state in the country. I mean, the area where I'm from, I guess, uh, are you, one of you, our main concerns. I'd be glad to come to your community <laughs> and give you a tour. And just tell them how bad it is. No, no, it's really, you, you just, you, you don't really know the kind of stuff that go on in your community. Uh, other than impacting your community until you move around. In North Carolina, I don't care what community you're from, is being impacted. Uh, there's some really bad stuff going on in every community in this country. And it's worse in some places than other. But Louisiana, for instance, Louisiana is six times larger than New Jersey. So if we plopped Louisiana down where New Jersey is, we would take in, oh gosh, we could take in New York City, Philadelphia, Niagara, New York, right? All that stuff in Elizabeth. I mean, would this be a polluted state or what? I mean, we don't well, have. Well, well, you know, I think this guy's got a question. But, 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 but the thing is, the thing is, if you assume, but the thing is, if you assume that it's worse somewhere else, uh, you're you're making a, a leap that you probably should. I don't assume that. But okay. I feel like there's a general okay. assumption, and. And it's more in y'all's face is what I've noticed. And so I'm sure it's a lot easier, or not easier. I'm not saying y'all have it easy at all. But what I'm saying is it's a little more difficult to convince someone that a chip mill is as much of a threat to them as when they can see the effects already right there. So I was wondering, like, what kind of outreach y'all do for people that aren't exactly interested in it? Statistics. Or, you have to bring people out. Hands on. You know, I can stand up here and I can show you pictures and I can talk, <coughs> but when you see something for yourself, mm -hmm. then you would know it. You know, pictures for it's a thousand words, but when people can come and see it, that's what it's getting back. Yes, Jim? I think another, another good response is echoing what I've heard you say and what I think I've heard uh, Mary Lou say is uh, educate yourself, know the statistics, no. know what's, why it's a problem, and then get out there and speak from your heart. Because if you communicate with another human being, speaking from your heart, you'll make that connection and you'll have a second person and that can kind of grow into the grassroots. Nobody and I think another thing that sometimes gets overlooked is look for people that you wouldn't normally expect to be a partner in something like this. I heard someone earlier say something about there was a group and they had someone who was a printer, or ran a print shop. So there could be businesses in your community that could help you in this fight. And, and sometimes people will overlook the business community because it's like, oh, we're going up against a business. Yeah. But there's any number of people with any number of talents that could be great allies. And if you look for the most broad base support possible, that's, and I mean, that's the part, kind of thing that challenge that leadership goes to figure out why that person should be interested. What, how are they affected? Are they affected economically? Do you feel like it's going to affect their health? Is it going to affect where they recreate? We're all motivated by ourselves, really. Something and you talk to somebody when you talk to them about how it's affecting them. And you're right, this is so much in our face that most people come to us because they've got a problem. You know, their child is sick, they're working in a plant that they feel like they're being poisoned, you know, the union's not treating them right, whatever, we need to get a union there, whatever the deal is. So I think that your job in leadership, and that's real, real tough when it isn't as, quote, a sexy as issue, we've had a lot of those. I mean, let's face it, people don't get that worked up about a racetrack. I mean, and we've won. All of our folks have organized with Willie Self and other people won on the racetrack. That's really important to those people. And one thing you got to remember, too, is you got to really respect other people's views about what's important to them. Because that person that stops the racetrack, then they realize, you know, that a stream next to them is contaminated or they're worried about the air and they evolve in, in, in their leadership role. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So yes. it, it, it puts a lot back, I think, on us and a lot of, at least for me, when I go home at night thinking about, you know, how can I make this work? Mm -hmm. How can we all make this work? And, you know, listen to our colleagues. Pat, well, Pat is it. very creative. He's behind that video mm -hmm. camera. That means and that's how I was certain that he went to camp with you. Yes! Hey. Yeah, no, so he's wonderful. Well, look, do it without look, we have three and Dave is wonderful. You've got a great resource. We have three questions right? that's, that's left, but I want to remember four. Yeah, four you got it. Well, you're on the roll now, huh? <laughs> uh, we have four questions, but I wanted to remember the arts. Be resourceful. Share the resources that you may have and you share from people, that's very important. Be respectful.
to the people that you're working with, even to the enemies. You have to wind up being res respectful and be responsible because we all are responsible in what's going on. So those three R's, you always remember those three R's. Now. I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about how being an elected public official impacts your activism and how they interact and what you, you know. They get crazy. That's <laughs> how they interact. How they interact, people have a fear first. Being in a position of being a public official and being around the big dogs, you know, you have to act nice and dainty. Usually I don't be looking good, look good like this. I usually have a be bare feet and hair sticking up in the air and ready to fight. <laughs> That's the way I be looking. But today I was acting intelligent, you know, coming to coming to, to talk to a group of youth people, so I wanted to represent. Uh, usually when you're on the board, they're having all kinds of different problems. They want to be conservative people and they don't want to touch the focus on the people. Who you, who you put in office, they're going to go the opposite way. So it's a very, it's like a mud and gel. And they can't stand my guts. That's how it is. But you know what you're out here for and dealing with the people. And that's a decision you make every day. You, you, I'm sorry, another question? Yeah, somebody, okay. Right, um, I remember. It's going sort of back to your question um, and, and trying to narrow down, like how would you reach out? You can reach out to people who are directly affected, like in Allison or Plaquemine or, or Grand Wall. Uh, but reaching out to people like in the Baton Rouge metro, how do you how do you get people like in Shenandoah or Kenilworth? Or I, I mean, I live in South. I live in South Downs. Quality of life. I'll, right. I'll tell you, so I'll I mean, tell you how do you say that? Because they, they don't see. They, unless they work, they, they're not seen as direct. Right. They, they, they are affected, but they just right. don't sign in their face. They don't see exactly. it's not in their face. Let me let me get back to his and question, and I'll tell you how Mary Lee got involved. Watch you got involved. But what you want to do if you're finding, if you're dealing with something in North Carolina, Carolina like a, a chipping mill, what you're trying to do is find a group somewhere else that's dealt with it, uh, and find out what they did and how they did it, and draw on other people's experiences. And, and it may not be the most important thing in the world, but if you live around something that's causing, people say, what's the most serious environmental problem in Louisiana? And I, and I get that question. It's a problem that's affecting you. Because that's what you're going to work on, the things that affect you personally. Mary Lee got involved in the environmental movement because Rollins was proposing to burn PCBs. What year was that, 85? 86, somewhere around. Yeah, 85. 85. 85. Mary Lee got involved because in 1980, I was able to go into the Allison community and help them organize uh, because in January of 80, I had uh, 36 workers from a nearby chemical plant signed a petition saying their health was being threatened by fumes from Rollins. When the winds blew toward them, they, and these are electricians and pipe fitters and stuff, and they had to put on gas masks uh, to work or to evacuate their work area because they were dropping like flies with these fumes coming out of this plant. Any time workers like that sign a petition, they're willing to lose their job. So it had to be really, really serious. And usually workers at one plant and company officials do not complain about another facility. And so I've been working with some people up there for about five years and hadn't made any headway at all. But when I saw that petition, I knew that was it. And so the lady I've been working with, I got her to find somebody in the community. And if you go to Deeper Shades of Green, there's a story about Mary McCastle and the Allison community. And in 1980, they didn't know why everybody in the community was sick. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't know where they got this black dust from. It was from Reynolds. They didn't know where this white dust came from. It was from Allied Signal with the high density <coughs> polyethylene plant. And I said, this is an all-black community. And I said, um, I'll be glad to work with you. What you do is every time you smell a really bad odor, if, if a bunch of you will write down what the odor smells like, how long it lasts, what it does to you, uh, call the, the environmental agency, and then about a month later, I got them to start calling the mayor's office and the city councilman mm -hmm. from their district. And they called them so much. And I said, you call me every time you smell an odor. I'll come up here. And they were calling me at 2 and 3 in the morning, Saturdays, Sundays, and wherever I was, if I could get there. I might have been in New Orleans or Lake Charles or wherever. I would stop what I was doing, I would drive up to Allison, and I would drive all the way around Rollins and figure out where the odors were coming from. And every time I went up there, I beat the state inspectors, who was the job it was. That was not my job. The job was to go up there. I always beat them by at least, uh, for the first few times, sometimes two and three days. 
I would get there two and three days before they did it. That's how fast they were responding. But it, at the least, I, I would beat them by at least three hours every time. And I said, what you want to do is start keeping track of this. And you want to start bothering your mayor and your city councilman and your mm -hmm. state representative and your senator because this company is bothering you. It's a nuisance. It's making everybody sick. So you need to let your public officials know that their constituents are having trouble. And the worst thing you want to do, you don't want to isolate your community. It's sitting out here, it's a little island, and I'm going to be real quick on this. <laughs> but but I, you want to know, the answer is not going to What I got them to do was to approach this problem so that it was, so that Mary Lee wouldn't say, the Mary Lees of the world, Mary Lee lives, she and I live in the same zip code, but we live about three miles apart. And she lives about 10 miles or 12 miles from where this facility was located. So for her to feel impacted, it had to be pretty big. And I said, what you don't want is from, and I didn't say Mary Lee because I didn't know that, but you don't want somebody in South Baton Rouge, like where I live, to say, oh, that's really terrible what's going on, and all that pollution affecting those people up in the house, and they're all sick. And that's really bad. I'm glad I don't live up there. You want them to say, oh, that's really bad what's going on up in the house, and it's affecting me. I'm going to go up there and help those people. In 1985, Mary Lee went up to Allison to help the people because she felt threatened by the team. By 1985, Rollins was the worst industrial facility in the state of Louisiana. My wife told me, as she talked to Mary Lee, my wife told me, if Rollins gets that permit to burn PCBs, we are selling our house and leaving Baton Rouge. <laughs> and that was after talking to Mary Lee, not talking to me. <laughs> I went, whoa, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. And, and so it's taking your problem, or, or wherever the community is, and, and not holding on to it as your problem, but figuring out how to make it the community's problem, how to make it your representative and your senator's problem and your mayor's problem. I guarantee you, after the mayor got about 15 phone calls at 2 and 3 in the morning about Rollins, he had the parish engineers, this engineering firm, go up and respond to those. And then they had the sheriff's deputies going up, and they had the state police going up. And finally, we got enough documentation and when the hearing came up with PCBs, the mayor of Baton Rouge was personally involved. And in this downtown auditorium, he had all of the officials from Rollins, their corporate headquarters up on the stage. He had all of the EPA officials from Dallas up on the stage. He had the whole city council up on the stage. And he had all of the state environmental officials. We had 1,300 people in the audience. People were screaming. It was <laughs> live on television. And, and six days. And it was bad. Yeah, and six we days. Were bad. Yeah, and six days. The Mothers Against Air Pollution got 3,000 3, signatures. And how many people did you have in your group? Five. 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 My wife was and, number two. Um, yeah. <laughs> Clean air, but Pat had something that he wanted to respond to your question about. And then as far as bringing more people in, I mean, everybody here probably has access to the internet, and they know the media is changing. Granted, it's getting more powerful, but there's absolutely much more outlets to get information out. So we're educating people a lot quicker and better, and it really comes down to dollars too. What we're doing with the Quality of Life campaign, we're, we've been our backs have been up against the wall, so to speak, since we started. We've always had you know, some multinational, international corporation rammed down a small community's throat and we had to mobilize as quickly as possible to make a defeat. But what we've done is we actually got a little bit on our feet and we're doing proactive campaigns showing how the quality of life is affected in Louisiana. And everyone is, you know, interested in a better quality of life for themselves. And showing how these multinational corporations are kind of pilfering our communities and showing how it's affecting their community and why you know, better jobs and their quality of life has been affected. It's, it's been a very, you know, big time turn for our organization to actually get proactive with that. But using, I mean, we never had an opportunity to have a, a decent camera, you know, ever before, but prices are coming down. We're, you know, we're hooked completely into the internet. We can take this image and manipulate it digitally now. So we're using these small tools that everyone has access to, and everyone has to be creative. I'm sure everybody in here has access to a decent computer with a decent program. You just got to keep getting information out in creative, artistic ways, too, you know. We did a 10-minute video and played it in New Orleans and won a 10-minute video festival. And it was, you know, BCR to BCR type cuts. But they played it on the public, you know, system in New Orleans 30 or 40 times a year. And people got information out just by being clever. Sure. Just yeah. by, you know, and you guys all have the tools to, you know, get creative. And I just urge you guys to use them.
and he's great at doing that. And uh, we, we think you guys are probably getting really tired and, and ready to go, but we, we usually begin our meetings with a prayer, and we often close out with a song. We, so we would really like to sing with you before we leave, if it's yeah. not too much. Yeah. And I, I want to answer uh, just one thing, too, or, or just say something to you. You know the little story about the, the little boy walking along the seashore with his grandpa, and he's thrown in the seashore, the little, what do you call him? Star. Star. No. Periwinkle. Star. 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 Whatever. Right? He keeps putting one in, putting one in, and the grandpa's like, why do you keep doing that? It isn't going to make any difference. But the little child says, what? Sure, man, a lot of difference that it's just Starfish. <laughs> right. Exactly. And on that so note, I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise. Yeah, we always have to hold hands. <laughs> Not that far. we got to get a little rowdy. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get a little rowdy. First, I'm going to ask you, when I ask you what time it is, you answer me back in four and say, four o'clock. 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 Four Really, you really feel rejuvenated. A lot of great people like Alberta there.